uh, feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask the question. Um, and then we'll, we'll respond back to those. Um, you're more than welcome to have your camera on or off, whichever is easiest for you. I'll keep mine on most of the time. Um, if the birds get too chirpy, I will, I'll go back inside. But I think right now we're going to, I'm going to sit outside here on my, on my porch area. Um, and so, and I also want to let you know that most of the building principals were invited to participate in today's journey. Uh, so I know we do have a few of them with us already. Um, and so they will be here to, to help uh, listen. Um, and the last thing is we are recording today's video. Just want to make sure everybody's comfortable with that. Uh, we are recording so that we can post this out for everybody else that, that couldn't come today. Um, so we want to let everybody know that as well. So with that, I'm going to ask uh, Jennifer Scott to introduce herself, uh, kind of talk about her journey and uh, then we're going to go into special education, both at at-home learning settings, as well as entering back at school. So, uh, Ms. Scott, you're on. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, I want to say thanks to Dr. Clendenning for making special education a priority and a topic for his coffee, virtual coffee. Um, I think especially during this time, we have a lot of questions um, going home. March in March, you know, March 13th was not something that we ever thought we would be doing. Um, and so I definitely want to answer your questions that you have today about what school may look like. Um, if we have to go home again, what does that look like? And, and hopefully ease your mind about, about school. And I see we have a couple teachers on here too and principals, so that's good as well. Um, so I'll let Dr. Clendenning kind of move forward or if parents want to ask questions. Before we do that, let's uh, do just do real quick. Uh, we have Dr. Hyden here from Creekside, I see. We have uh, CBIS teachers Christy Bayless uh, is with us. We have Dawn Phelps, who has been everywhere in our district, but right now she resides at uh, the middle school. But I think there's some, some things possibly uh, percolating there that, that she would move to some others. We also have uh, Principal Zook on the line with us today. And uh, we have a brand new teacher, Madeline Daly. So Madeline, welcome. She's going to be at Needham Elementary. So she's representing the Bulldogs um, on that end. So those are the, the, the teachers that I see on the list that are present. So I want to let, make sure I knew them so that when, when things come up, if someone says something, you'll know that they're a teacher. And, they're, and I appreciate the parents and the community coming. So let's talk just a little bit about that. So, uh, uh, Jen, as, as you've looked at the last three months of life, what were some of the ahas that came up out of the at-home learning that we're going to need to think about uh, as we move forward with re-entry? I mean, I think, you know, in, in talking to teachers and hearing from families, uh, many of our case conferences the last couple months were done virtually. Um, communication is just super important, and that's communication with our students, but also with our families about what school looks like. Um, and again, I think it being home kind of emphasized how important that is, even when we are in school. Um, I, one of the positive things that I see coming out of us going home is that lines of communication were opened up that maybe weren't there before. And I hope moving forward that our parents feel more comfortable reaching out to teachers, reaching out to administrators, um, contacting me if, if necessary. But I see that as kind of one of those silver linings that we, we saw that we can work together. We can talk on a daily basis or weekly basis. Um, so that was just one of those ahas for me. And I hope teachers felt the same and, and parents as well, because I know that sometimes it can be intimidating making a phone call or sending that first email to a teacher, especially if you have a concern or a question. So again, kind of aha, let's communicate. I mean, that's just number one. Um, Another aha was that we saw that some of our kids did really well at home. Uh, we heard some positive feedback that their kids felt less stressed, fewer distractions. And so we were able to have conversations about how can we, how can we take that at home setting and recreate it a little bit better at school um, for kids. We also learned more about kids being at home, having parents working with them. Um, 
we had good conversation about, oh, I see now what you're talking about, or let's work together now on, on helping this student do better at school. So um, I, I, I really think being at home was a, an interesting opportunity for all of us to get to know each other better, um, get to know our kids better, the educational process, how they learn. Um, so I, those, were, those were a couple of the ahas. All right, I'm gonna uh, hit pause and, and ask some of the parents to, to kind of uh, share both their perspectives and, and maybe pose a question to either Jen or myself uh, about where we're headed as we continue. Jen, let me ask you this. So how are we going to make sure that we progress monitor to support the students um, as we move forward? So a priority when we come back to school is we, we have to definitely progress monitor our kids. We would do that normally, but maybe not right at the very beginning of school. Um, but it's definitely a priority for our teachers of record to progress monitor our students and see where they are in August compared to the end of school, but also compared to the, when we last saw them face to face. Um, I think more importantly, we want to see where their progress was March 13th versus where they are when school starts. Um, and if we have to make some adjustments to IEPs, meaning revisions to goal, uh, we will do that. We will all take confidence. Some of our kids, I think, are moved right along. Um, um, continued to show progress. Some even showed more progress at home than, than they did at school. And I think because they had, had um, you know, fewer distractions, maybe a little more individualized attention with a, the with a parent. Um, some of our kids we know will have regressed. We're, we're very aware of that. And so we definitely want to address that um, and make sure that, that we provide the services that kids need. Um, progress monitoring in general, though, will continue to be um, how it's outlined in each IEP. Um, that's that's typically individualized in the goal, how we say we're progress monitoring. So it's not like we progress monitor every student every two weeks. Um, it's just based on how that goal is written. We, we, do have a, go ahead, Robin. we do have a couple questions. Um, one is curious as to what the class will look like. They've seen that other schools are putting plastic around the desks. Mm -hmm. um, so can you maybe talk a little bit about what our classrooms will look like? Yeah, so that's a really, I appreciate the question. Um, right now, the thing that we know for sure, we're going to be in straight rows, the kids facing one direction. Um, we are looking at um, how many classroom desks can we get in inside. Um, we are communication with Dr. Mormon from the Johnson County Health Department. And he's going to be the, the, the final authority on does our, does our classroom look safe. Um, we have not purchased um, plastic bubbles or anything for each desk or anything at this point in time. The one thing that we're hearing from both Dr. Mormon and Dr. Box, uh, who is the Indiana Department of Health uh, physician, she says that you know, as long as the kids are facing in one direction, um, she feels like that's a that's a a good start. Social distancing is going to be an issue for us as we travel forward, right? We want to make sure that we provide a safe environment for both kids and the teachers. But what does social distancing look like? Uh, Dr. McCormick, who is the superintendent for the state of Indiana, you know, said that social distancing may be defined differently in each school setting based on the size of the classroom and, and those type things. But for us right now, I can tell you the one thing we're looking at is all the desks in one row. I've asked, um, and Mr. Sewell's overseeing with the, with the building principals, for teachers to clean out their rooms, um, which if you've been to a lot of the classrooms, we create a cozy, warm environment. Um, unfortunately, I'm afraid that it's gonna look different in the year uh, 2021. Um, we're, not, we're gonna try to maximize floor space, so we're gonna ask teachers if they have personal items that are on the floor that they get them off the floor either take them home or whatever and we have started that that process of cleaning out rooms this past couple of weeks right now school is still closed we're not allowed to be uh, on our on our facilities for like playground use or outside use uh, but we are going into the buildings and asking teachers to clean out their rooms right now 
Um, so I think the rooms themselves are going to look a little more stark. Um, we're trying to figure out how we do small group. I uh, just got done with a, a, a 90 minute meeting before this. In the very end, we were talking about how do you do small group learning so that you're engaging kids in that conversation if we only have straight rows. Um, we don't have that answer yet, but we are working on that answer. Um, so hopefully that, that helps uh, uh, lay some of the foundational work for what the class is going to look like. Mrs. Betts, what else? Uh, Mrs. Scott mentioned that some kids did really well at home. Um, how can we recreate that home environment? Um, this one was especially at Custer Baker. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the, the first thing is we, our teachers of record have identified who the kids are that did really well in that setting. And I think when we meet in case conferences and we look at what that instruction looks like from um, the special education side, that's something to consider because we always consider um, the least restrictive environment. Should a student be in their general ed classroom participating in that larger group? Would they do better in a, in a smaller setting for that direct instruction? And our goal certainly is always to, to be in gen ed and to be with their peers, but this particular experience for us um, may be the evidence that we need to say, you know what, while our goal is always gen ed, we know now that this particular child exceeded what we, what we thought um, in that smaller group setting, more one-on-one -on -one or, or two or three students for that instruction. And so sometimes we don't have that evidence and so we do um, push best practice, which is to be in gen ed, but this is the evidence now that we have to say, we, I, I know as mom that my student did better in that small group, which would be at home. Um, and so when we look at, at writing those services, when we're looking at a special ed setting versus a gen ed setting, we have evidence now to support um, maybe that small group special, special ed setting for it, direct instruction of IEP goals. We had another parent uh, give a shout out to Mrs. Simmons at Custer Baker, um, who was really flexible when the original plan for at-home learning didn't work for him. And I think that kind of goes back to what you said about communication and just that parent reaching out and saying, this isn't working for my kid. How can we do better? So, you know, right. one of the things that I, I do, that that's great uh, to hear about the flexibility. Um, there, there were a few stressors for us on the school side of life. And now let's talk about the essential skills. You know, the way that we were able to deliver that classroom setting when we're back on our campus uh, looks dramatically different uh, at home. And we have got to figure that out a little bit more. One of the things, for example, um, in our high school setting, a lot of those kids don't necessarily have that one-to-one -one device like everybody else. So we, we are actually moving forward with having a one-to-one -one device uh, for all kids, K through 12 next year um, to help us with that. And if their IEP calls for some type of communication device that's different, um, Mrs. Scott and Mr. Sprout are working on that to ensure that that does take place. Um, you know, when we're looking at OT and PT and speech services, we need to continue to provide those opportunities for people. And I know that Mrs. Scott's subcommittee is looking at that as well as Early Wood, uh, which is our, our, you know, LEA for our district, you know, that, that helps us think about special ed and do things special ed uh, to make sure we're meeting all kids' needs. So those are some couple of things that we had that, um, that, that we saw as, as, as things we must address. I will tell you right now, we are going back to school August the 5th, okay? So everybody right now, you can go ahead and circle that, and we're going back. Um, we're going to have our plan delivered to everybody. Uh, the board is going to vote and, and review the plan uh, the end of this month. Um, we'll continue to communicate out what that plan means for everybody. So Mrs. Betts and myself will be working on that. Um, and then... What we want is mom and dad to make that best decision. You guys are still the best teachers, the best, the best uh, counselor for your for your children to know what we're going to do, and we're going to partner together to make this happen. And so we're gonna we're gonna share our plan for July so that when we go back in August, we're ready to go. Um, so that's where we're headed. So Mrs. Bez, I saw a couple more questions come up. Yeah, um, one of the parents said. Um how it could be hard to judge exactly what the students did versus parents helping them to get it over with. Um, 
aside from relearning in general, how are we going to assess where the kids are? Are they behind? Are they on track? How's that going to work when we get back to school? In ter well, and, you know, in terms of the special education side of life, um, you know, our, our IEPs have kind of a couple of main components. We talk about present levels of a student um, that drives the goals that we propose, which drives the services. So in terms of assessing where they are in their IEPs, our teachers of record will progress monitor for their goals. That's their responsibility. Now, if we jump to the general ed side of life and, and all students and their grade level curriculum, then, um, you know, in the K-6, I'm not sure about middle school right now, but NWEA is one of the ways that we get a baseline assessment of where kids are. Um, and it can, we get some information about, you know, strengths and needs, where those gaps might be. Um, so that's something that will happen early in the year um, when that window opens. Hopefully it's earlier than, than later um, so that we can get in and really see where they are. But that, those are, they're kind of two sides of life there. Um, we have that the IEP goals, which are very individualized to the student versus their grade level curriculum in WEA assesses that. Got it. I don't know, Dr. C, if you had something you wanted to add. Yeah a couple things so the other thing we're doing uh to help support students in that relearning cycle um part of the federal dollars from the um to support COVID 19 learning processes we're going to be hiring uh assistance for each building to help us uh bring up and bolster some of those lagging or uh, strategies that that, that occurred so we will be doing continuous feedback loops to make sure we're, we're moving forward with that um, because we don't want students to, you know, feel like, oh man, I gotta, I'm gotta i getting dumped on all of, all of the settings right now. We're also going to do a jumpstart program this summer. And that jumpstart program is going to be two weeks before school starts um, where we're, we're going to have kids come back uh, to school and it's going to be at CVIS and then they're going to do um, little little field trips or whatever into their buildings probably just to get back to that setting of what school looks like. But in that Jumpstart program, we're going to be um, quickly assessing and then creating that pathway for kids. We understand that that learning cycle for parents and for kids during the last three months looks different for everybody. Um, and we want to make sure that our kids continue to, to grow um, and it's going to probably, it's going to take time. It's not going to be done in, in just a few days. Um, so, yeah, that hopefully that answers some of that question. So, Robin. Dr. Hyden, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Uh, um, everything that was talked about so far is exactly right. The Jumpstart program will help quite a few um, of our students get started into the school year, a two-week early lead time. Um, the CARES Act dollars we're receiving from the federal government and the state like Dr. Clendenning said, we're going to hire additional staff per school, which their their job is going to be focused on using our initial data. Um, Ms. Scott mentioned that we do NWEA testing, and we do that the first week or two weeks of the school year. So we have that data right off the bat, um, and we do that that quickly because we want that bench that that baseline benchmark data quickly, so that way we know what students have learned what they've not learned. And, and we'll be able to compare that with the winter information we had before COVID-19 hit and compare that with what we have now and where students are now. And we have the additional staff in place uh, to begin tutoring um, and working with students in small groups or even individually. Um, and that's in addition to all of the work our teachers normally do anyway with small group instruction and, and interventions for kids. So um, I think we're, we're in really good position to, to catch kids up um, we'll know where they are and we'll be able to work with them and 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 make up some ground. And then, of course, if kids didn't lose ground, that we're in good position to uh, enrich them and and keep moving them forward, too. So um, we'll we'll be able to take all of that into account and we'll be able to figure that out pretty quickly as the year gets started in person. That's awesome. Um we know the huge focus on academics and making students are where they need to be academically. But will that leave time? for activity, play, recess, PE, that kind of thing? Um, yes, definitely. Uh, I, 
uh, in all of our conversations thus far, um, we, we still plan to have recess every day like we always do, in, in, at least at the elementary level, I can speak to directly. Um, we do 30 minutes of recess a day um, and we will continue to have that. And I believe right now the plan is still to have that outside on the playground, weather permitting. Um, we'll have additional um, uh, safeguards in place having to do with washing or sanitizing hands on the way out, on the way in. Um, because, you know, we know that kids will be sometimes touching the same recess ball or the same equipment. So we'll take that safeguard. Um, but kids definitely need to play outside and, and get an exercise. And then, of course, we still have physical education classes as well at every elementary school, too. So, um, you know, we'll be we will still get the kids up and moving. And of course, elementary teachers are notoriously excellent at uh, brain breaks, go noodle breaks, things like that, just in those little few minutes between subject area uh, switches to keep kids active and moving too. So I don't believe any of that will ch change. Great. Right, right now, what we're hearing from Johnson County Health Department is uh, outside recess is still a good thing, right? Um, if you're looking at from the CDC guidance and some of those things, you're going to see them maybe a little more strict, but we're working with Dr. Mormon on that. Um, we do want kids to go outside. We want them to, to participate. Um, we realize that outside recess, they're probably not going to be socially distanced all the time. The kids are going to maybe run into each other and do some of those things. Uh, but we are going to provide the, the safest environment possible. Uh, so I saw a question come about masks. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about masks for just a second. Um, I will tell you that one of the, one of the guiding principles from all of the Johnson County schools, the superintendents have met and we've, we've come up with some key things that we're going to all do similarly. And one of them is we're going to strongly recommend masks, both to and from school and in large group settings. Um, I think inside the classroom, when the kids are facing one direction, um, they probably won't wear a mask at that time, but we don't have all the details on that. I would tell parents, you know, if they're on the bus, whatever the bus looks like, there's a, they're, they're going to probably be required to wear a mask on the bus because I don't know how we're going to be able to socially distance getting kids to and from school. Uh, in the hallways, you're probably going to see that mask uh, as well. But we don't know all of that, but I would just say that masks are going to be a big part of that. Um, are we going to provide masks for kids? That's a good question. Um, what we did right now, we have purchased uh, enough masks for one kid per, per throughout the district. But it's, a, but it's a disposable mask. I would tell parents, you might want to uh, invest in a cloth mask for your child. Um, we will also have masks set up like if, in the clinic setting and things like that if a kid does get sick. Um, the state guidance on the clinic is that we try to have a separate clinic area for kids that come down with symptoms during school so that we don't mix and you know the, the kids around um and so we will we will have that available as well with the clinic having masks uh the teachers are going to get three masks i will tell you we're gonna we're gonna have one for the teachers to use one to have them available and one to to be kind of recycling and washing at the same time um, we partnered with the company or with an organization called Serve and Sew that created quilts and masks for all of the essential workers. Um, and we have 700 of those. So every employee will get a mask. We're also giving a mask out for all of our teachers that when we go back to school. And then the buildings are also creating a mask. Um, I do have uh, another uh, person who's reached out and they've adopted web and needham and the middle school and they're they're, per, they're they're getting masks themselves for those teachers and uh support staff so we're going to have masks it will be a part of our of our life but i do think we we can also understand that kids aren't going to wear the mask every single day like dr mormon said they'll be on their head they'll be on their ears they'll be pulling them all different ways and, and it's just not really realistic to think the kid's going to wear them all the time um so we're gonna we're gonna do the very best we can in creating that safe environment, um, uh, but it's it's gonna be strongly recommended, you know, as we travel forward. So, Mrs. Betts, what what else has come up? Well, I would just Maybe. I think you've you've covered the mask question, but I know that for some of our parents, that's a big concern. 
um, of all the things we're worried about, it's it's the mask. And we have some kids that um, it's not even a matter of they'll wear it. Sometimes we know that they won't wear it for multiple reasons. We have some kiddos with sensory issues. We have kids that have some pretty deep fears about wearing one. We have some kids with health concerns that wearing a mask may not be, um, especially if they're pretty significantly asthmatic, wearing a mask is not in their best interest. Um, and then for our preschoolers, it's not even recommended because of their age. Um, the CDC doesn't recommend, you know, for our, for our babies to be wearing masks. Um, they can suck them in and choke. So um, we're, we're certainly considering all of that for classrooms, um, especially with our, our three to four year olds. Um, but but being just please know we we understand and that um, some kids will want to wear a mask and they'll feel more comfortable and then others just can't. Um, and so there, I don't want to speak out of turn, but there aren't going to be discipline issues for a student who just can't wear a mask. You know, um, we we want to make sure that we respect each of their their individual needs. So this is more of a general building question versus special education. Um, but can you touch a little bit on how we're disinfecting and cleaning the schools, um, parents with kiddos that their sicknesses really take them out of school for quite a while um, mm -hmm. are having fear about sending them back. Yeah, uh, Mr. Sewell and his team are continuing to, to clean the buildings right now, you know, kind of from head to toe, if you will, uh, in that. During the school year, we will be cleaning those high contact areas uh, with due diligence, we're partnering with another company that's come up with a solution. Um, that solution uh, is used right now for like oral surgeries and burn victims. That does uh, uh, kill the virus, but it, it doesn't uh, hurt the person. And so we'll be using that for a lot of our countertop spaces and it's gonna be put on with the sprayer when kids are gone. On the bus, we are gonna be, be cleaning the bus more frequently, um, probably, at the end of each day uh, and clean out because we want to make sure that that is a very safe environment. The bus is a tr tricky a tricky one for us. I'll just tell you that right now. Um, I saw the CDC guidelines and, and the state saying socially distance. I don't know how you socially distance on a bus when we have, you know, anywhere between 40 and you know 72 kids on that bus. But we are looking at, at a lot of options. I don't have the answers right now, but uh, we do have a subcommittee that is that is helping us think about that, uh, looking at our routes, looking at proximities. Um, we would also encourage moms and dads that if you want to bring your kids, you know, right now, um, out of our 5,100 kids, about 3,100 check that they ride the bus. But out of the actual number that ride, it's a much smaller number anyway, because a lot of parents check for that one day a week when they do need to do that. Um, one of the things I think parents are going to have to think about in this in terms of our busing is that we may only be able to take the kid to like one address all year just to, for, to, for our sake and to keep everybody safe. So parents are going to have to help us think about where do you want that, that child delivered and picked up each day um, on the bus side. Also, uh, we're going to limit, uh, kids won't be able to go home with their buddies on our buses. It's just, as we look at uh, safety precautions and everything, uh, we just don't want to be able to do that. So that's going to be another thing that you're going to see uh, come out of our guidelines is that we're not going to, you know, be having a bunch of kids ride different buses to and from places. And if parents want their kids to go to a different house, um, we're just asking them to partner with them and to find a different solution on that. But all of the bus details we don't have yet, um, but we will be getting those. And that's one of the things that will be in our plan that's going to be delivered um, to the board in May uh, or in, in June, on June 29th, um, is look, looking at our bus routes and of that. You know, if you look at uh, the, the bus driver, some things we do know about the bus, we're not going to be able to put the bus driver in a bubble either, right? We're not allowed to modify the bus or anything like that. So we got to figure out how to best protect that, that bus driver. Um, so I do think you're going to see the kids will be required to wear masks on the bus, both to and from school. Uh, the bus driver will have a mask on. And remember, the mask is if I'm wearing it, I'm protecting you. And if you're wearing it, you're protecting me. And that's going to be our journey and our thought process throughout this COVID-19 
uh, school year era. So uh, that's a little bit about transportation. I don't have all the full details. I just get, once again, some high level things I know that we're, we are going to be implementing. Uh, Ms. Scott, you have anything else on that? I don't. Okay. Mrs. Beth, any other questions that have come up? I don't have any additional questions right now. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we uh, just reiterate to the parents, you, you all are the best uh, in knowing your kids. Um, we're going to partner with you in providing education. That's what we're going to do um, and, and moving forward with that. And that's why we want to give everybody a month to think about what does school look like and does it fit them. Obviously, the CDC and state and local officials said, listen, that there are some, some high risk groups in, in this pandemic era, you know, uh, people over 65 and people with autoimmune uh, concerns and, and other pre-existing conditions. We want to provide a safe environment for everybody. And that's, that's going to be our goal to partner with you parents in this journey that we do that. Um, and we want to do school, you know, uh, and, and we want to do as normal life as possible. That's why we are going to have recess. Lunch is going to be a big deal. I will just tell you lunch is something we're looking at. Um, it's going to be spread out more than we've known in the past. Um, right now, it, it may be in the classrooms. It may be in larger spaces. Um, we'll have the full detail on that plan uh, as it, get, it by in two weeks. But I will tell you that lunch is going to look different. We do know kids aren't going to self-serve themselves anymore for this school year during the salad bar stuff. It'll all be kind of prepackaged uh, items uh, that they'll just kind of kind of grab and pick up. Um, water fountains uh, are going to be kind of off limits to drink, but just just out of the, the water fountain with your mouth. We are going to look at water. We are going to have water bottles and cups. Um, that's going to be another guiding principle out of the, the Johnson County um, superintendent's conversations um, that we're going to say, listen, we, you know, bring water in. Uh, the USDA says that we can have water three times a day through our, our lunch program or breakfast program. So we are looking at getting uh, bottled water for our kids at three different times during the day. Um, but as far as the actual water fountains, we won't be drinking out of them uh, with, uh, with our mouths. Um, although, although that's a, just a side note, it's interesting to hear the professionals talk about that on the medical side. Some say it's okay, that it's going to be washed away, the virus. Some are going to say, don't do it. So we're just going to stick up, stick with the, uh, that we're going to, we're going to provide a water cup or, or a water bottle station, uh, to help with that. The high school, they are getting new water bottle stations. The Johnson County REMC just awarded uh, a couple days ago, um, a grant to pay for a new water station down by the, the fine arts area, uh, which would be a water bottle station. We have two already in the other end of the building and one in the main section, I think, is what we're looking at as well. So we're trying to do that with regard to water and lunch to help with that. All right. We've got lots of questions coming okay. in. Okay. So let's start at the top. All right. Um, have we received any guidance on sports gatherings or other clubs, extracurriculars? Yep. We we did receive a very specific structure for extracurricular sports, band, and choir. Uh, beginning on July the 6th, we can begin to go back in small group sessions for, for, for all those domains. Um, and then there's a phase approach. And Ten days later, we can go back to larger group settings. Um, it's recommended the coaches wear masks uh, whenever possible. But as we talk about the heat and some of those things, that may not always be possible. Um, but we are going back to do sports. Um, I will tell you that we are having a conversation about spectators watching sports um, when the school year starts. If we look to the higher education domain, for example, I just heard Purdue made the decision. They're only going to let 25% of the people in Ross State Stadium for football games. Well, that, that's a stark reality. So Mr. Doty and I are talking about what does that look like for us. So we will be getting that out as soon as possible. But we are going back to do sports uh, with kids. 
one thing that the state did say uh, was we could use our old physicals from a year ago, but I would encourage moms and dads to go ahead and go to your physicians and, and get that physical anyway. Um, you know, it's not going to be required. The state's going to say that you're allowed to play with last year's physical, but we're encouraging everybody to go back and get that physical. And that would be all of ours. The other extracurricular, you know, marching band is going to go on. They're going to start uh, coming out in, in July to do some of those things. I do think there are going to be some lagging things that are going to take place. You know, in the past, we would have gone on, if you're a band parent, you know this, we would have started right when school was out and we would be halfway through putting our show together right now. Um, that's not the case. It will be a very slow rollout for some of those things. Um, we are looking at a study that's coming out um, at the end of this month with regard to band and choir. And is it possible that those activities uh, have a, a stronger propensity to spread the virus? And so that study is coming uh, and we'll look at that, um, you know, in, in providing uh, our guidance. But we are going to do sports. So that's a short answer. Long answer to a short Maybe a short answer could have been provided, but I wanted to make sure everybody knew that. Okay, um, Jen, this parent has a question regarding special ed supports in the classroom. The CDC has suggested that kids stay with the same teacher and in the same room. How does that work with kids who need additional support? Yeah, I mean, um, we our, our goal going in is to continue to follow IEPs, and so... I do understand the CDC's guidelines. I, it, I don't know how realistic it is. Um, we, we would have to have a special ed teacher per classroom and that's just not possible. I don't even think we have the talent pool out there for that, but um, we will certainly do everything we can to mitigate the spread of the virus. So if that's fewer transitions, um, I talked to a committee yesterday about, you know, maybe some of our kids who have small group um, and they might have to walk two hallways down. Maybe we, we don't do that and we try to find locations where they're closer and not traveling as far or, or as often. Um, and, and also looking at, you know, the way the, the IEP is written, if our instruction does say that the student is in a special education classroom and not gen ed, maybe we talk to the family about revising that and saying, um, we'd rather push in and keep the child in the same classroom so that we're not moving all over the building throughout the day. Um, those are all individual decisions. I certainly um, would never make a blanket decision in special education. And so those are all case by case basis. And I would, I would say a couple of things to parents. Um, if you have a, a big concern about that, reach out to either me, your building principal or the teacher of record when, when school starts. Um, and I know some parents are going to say, just do what, you know, follow the IEP and, and do what it says. So kind of my final response to all of those would be individual decisions, um, case by case, and, and we will address those as, as there are needs that come up. And uh, I would agree as we look at uh, clustering kids so that we can maximize our, our talent pool, as Mrs. Scott said, um, we want to make sure that the kids are getting their best education. You know, as I understand the CD says that we should keep the kids and move the teachers. Um, I think in theory that is that really works, but I don't know that how practical it is with some of the things that we have, especially as you get older, right? And you're in the high school setting, it's very difficult. There's just really no way you're going to have the kids all stay in one class and then have the teachers rotate through because of the way the classes are set up. Elementary wise, we're looking at that, but uh, we will follow the IEPs. We're going to we're going to partner with moms and dads uh, to ensure that, that that child is getting the education they need and should receive. Um, this parent says she knows details aren't finalized yet, but do we have an idea if kids will go Monday through Friday or will there be some scheduled e-learning days each week? We are full tilt right now, August 5 through uh, May, the last few weeks in May. We're, we're, we are not planning uh, breaks. We're gonna keep the same calendars. We'll have fall break still, spring break still. Uh, Christmas break. Um, I will tell you that, you know, obviously just like uh, this year, I would have never predicted on March the 11th that two days later we'd be out of school for the rest of the year. Um, I will tell you the state is not inclined to give waiver days. 
Um, they want to see the kids go to school for 180 days. Whatever that looks like will be up to us. Um, there was a lot of confusion on when does the school year end in the state of Indiana. And the school year actually ends on June the 30th. And so um, I don't think we're going to get waiver days. I do think we'll go to school and there are no built-in, you know, COVID e-learning days to clean the buildings. Um, if we do have a student or a staff member get sick, we will partner with Johnson County Health Department on what that looks like. You know, will it be uh, closing the building down for deep cleaning for a few days uh, and those type of things. I will tell you, we are reviewing our policies because right now our policy says, for example, if we have a 20% threshold of kids being out, that's when we would close the school and, and try to get healthy again through cleaning and those type things. We're, we are reviewing our uh, COVID-19 pandemic policies to make sure they fit. But right now we're going to school August 5th and we're going to stay for 180 days and hopefully it'll all, all go well. Um, you mentioned policies. One parent wanted to know if there would be any changes to the absence policy. Yep. Good question. Um, we are going to, yes, I think you're going to see more grace. We're also going to get away from perfect attendance. We want moms and dads to be the first screeners of their kids. If your kid's not feeling well, if they have a fever, and one of the things that we're hearing, a fever is 100.4. That's what we're hearing that the, the Johnson County Health Department is going to list as a fever. Um, we're going to ask that moms and dads, you screen your kids first. And if there's any inkling they're not feeling well, keep them home. But we are going to remove away from uh, perfect attendance concepts and, and those things. Uh, we will have a little more grace. Listen, if, if, if you want to keep your kids home, keep them home. We're going to work with, you know, in the past, if you, got, if you were out seven days, you got this nice cordial letter that said hey just a reminder you got to come to school we're gonna we're gonna look at that letter and and address that we talked about it at the principal level i think even dr hyden weighed in on that the other day so so we will have grace listen this is this is going to be a, a year of, of, of many new things um we want to make sure the kids get their best education and if mom and dad feel like they need to keep their children home for their own safety then we just want to partner with them. We don't want to cause undue stress. Now, I will tell you, if we do see in the past where where something else happens and and there are issues, uh, then we'll we will continue to work with the parents and other agencies to support that. But we will have grace this year. That's ex I guarantee you that we're going to have grace. Um, are we aware of any new immunizations that will be mandatory this year? Uh, the immunizations are still that are still the same right now. I will tell you that um, as the vaccine comes available, that will be required as we travel forward. Um, I have talked to Dr. Mormon. I know that the Johnson County Health Department is already thinking about how do you mass distribute a COVID-19 vaccine. Um, so they are looking at that. But right now, um, parents, especially like if you're an incoming kindergartner or incoming uh, middle schooler or high schooler, you do need to get those uh, immunization shots. We'll still be required to, to, to honor those. And Mrs. Martin, our school nurse, uh, will work with you on that. Um, I do know that JMH is looking at some type of, you know, kind of drive-through immunization and some of those things that were originally on the on the table to have a discussion. But parents, you do want to make sure you have that on. And when COVID-19 uh, vaccines available, we'll make sure that we we share that information and get that out as quickly as possible. I do think the good news is I tell people uh, often, you know, we're one day closer to a vaccine. Uh, or something that's going to help us as we travel forward. Uh, Dr. Mormon uh, and Dr. Dunkel, I would say, are both, you know, optimistic uh, that we are that we're doing things the right way, socially distancing, honoring each other, um, and that that we will have some solution uh, in the future. So when we, when that comes, we're going to make sure everybody knows about it, so that we can get back to normal school, normal life. 
A uh, quick follow-up question about the water bottles. Will students be allowed to bring their own so that we're not wasting okay. plastic? Yes. Okay. Um, pool, will it be open to swim and diving in July? No. And I will okay. tell you why no. Um, we, we understand that on July 1st, the state is, is out of their phases. Um, but I will tell you that we're not opening our facilities up for one more month because we've been out for three months. We've got to make sure we deep clean everything. And I don't have the ability to, if we allow uh, youth programs or FIRST or AAU to come in and use the facilities to clean and then go back and double that out. Right now, swimming and diving are at the uh, outdoor pool here in town. They will continue that through the month of July. Okay, uh, this parent would like to know, um, do we have any plans to address the additional mental health needs of the students? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, yes, we, we have an actual sub, we have six subcommittees right now helping us think about reentry. One's academics, uh, special education, and Mrs. Scott is, is leading that. We do have one uh, with regard to social emotional learning. We have one for technology one for operations and communication. So yes, on the mental health side of life, we are looking at how to best support the kids. Um, as you know, that was part of our referendum to, to support on the mental health side. We, we are right now looking at um, both uh, additional supports in the building, also uh, some type of uh, distance communication. The Bowen Center is offering some some online resources to help. Um, we purchased a program called Sweet 360 that uh, Mrs. Scott and Mrs. Sperling helped look at that. And there's a whole module on mental health, both to help with the kids, the teachers, and the parents. So we'll be using that. Um, we're gonna we're gonna focus on mental health because it's not gonna just be kids that are gonna be anxious and concerned. It's gonna be adults that are gonna be anxious and concerned. So mental health focus is one of the things that we will focus on. It also is a part of the CARES Act, right? Um, that, that could that could we could bring into play to help support kids. Um, good suggestion from a parent here. Um, just talking about how this might be a good chance, a good chance to get parents to walk or ride bikes to school with their kids. Um, could possibly reduce the number of kids on a bus and also the number of cars in a car line. I would agree completely. And I'll just tell you, parents, right now, we are looking at walk zones um, to help with, with buses. I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I would agree, parents. We've looked at a walking bus. Uh, for many of you know that I lived in the northern part of the state, uh, in Goshen, Indiana, for 15 years. We had a walking bus in for that, uh, where we assigned people at the front of the bus and the back of the bus, and we helped kids walk to school. So we're looking at all those options, and I would agree with that parent. Uh, and and uh, riding the bike, I think is a great idea. Uh, if anybody ever wants to ride, just let me know. I, I just I just finished riding to Bloomington on Saturday, 56 miles. It was all uh, all fun. But we do need to make sure that um, we get kids to to school safely and home safely. But but I do think walking, riding are going to be a possible options uh, in the coming future. Dr. Clendenning, is there anything now that says parents? can't ride their kids to school like if no. is, okay so if, if that's something you're interested in you can certainly do that okay yeah, yeah um, this is david sloop i um yeah i noticed that like last year i mean julie my daughter was the only kid in the whole school that walked or rode or bike to school all last year and they took the bike racks out that i had noticed the previous year when they did all the landscaping i kind of asked about that and he said and hey, mr zook said technically they weren't allowed to ride their bikes to school or walk to school by themselves. Yeah. But, you know, I work literally two miles away. We live two miles away. So I'd take her, drop her off, lock her bike up, and then I'd continue my ride to my work. Yeah. So um, I really would love to see other kids. I and mean, I'm a health, kind of a health, try to keep stay healthy. And I hate seeing all the cars sitting idling in the car, in the car line every day. And uh, 
So yeah, if the weather's cooperating and we're running on time and half time, I mean, we generally rode our bikes every single day last year. So, but yeah, that definitely could alleviate some of the bus issues and some of the, you know, if, if kids aren't riding the bus, they're obviously going to be sitting in a car and the car lanes can get out of control. So, yeah. uh, I would love, definitely love to see an encouragement to get others, other people out there on their bikes and on, you know, walking and hey, yeah. it's better for everybody's health. <laughs> uh, Mr. Slip, I agree with you a hundred percent. We're like-minded on that. And yeah, so we, we don't have walk zones and I guess there's a history to that, but, but, and so Mr. Zook saying, you know, legally we don't do that. We just didn't have walk zones. Absolutely. You can ride the bike, the bikes to school. We will make sure that we have bike racks. Um, I would tell parents, you want to provide your own lock uh, so that you can lock your bike up. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. Regarding uh, safety at the intersections. Here's a little known, probably unknown fact. Uh, it's actually a city responsibility for crosswalks. Um, so we'll be partnering with the, the, the city of Franklin to help us when we designate those um, and move forward. And so that's that's what we're looking at. I see some things coming up with regard to skateboards. Is that right, Mrs.? So <laughs> listen, I think if there's any way kids want to get to school, we're going to be okay. What I would suggest is please don't show us your best Tony Hawk move. <laughs> when you're jumping over the bike rack or sliding on the rail. Um, but no, listen, if kids want to ride their long boards and their skateboards and walk to school, um, you know, I agree with uh, Mr. Sloop that, listen, it, it's a healthy way to, to keep us moving forward. Um, and, it, and there are so many benefits to that early morning exercise uh, that I would say, yes, you know, we're going to, we're going to continue to that skateboards. We're going to allow them, you know, I don't know. I'm not sure what we're going to do about lockers, but, we would we will accommodate the help uh, in that regard with regard to transportation to school. Yeah, I know Mr. Zook had Mr. Sewell dig the old bike rack out of storage and put it back out for us. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I know a lot of you guys are my age and back in our day, I mean, tons of kids or the bike racks were full at the schools, you know, I just, it's a big, culture change for me not to see a bunch of bike racks in the in, or a bunch of bikes in the racks so yeah anyway well, thank you, you very much and i appreciate it get a lot of people out of their cars and out exercising on the way to and from school so yeah all right yeah. thanks thank guys you. yeah thank you very much that's great and and we were part of a, a um a grant program that was um a walk zone sidewalk program uh, with the city a few years ago. If you notice, like at the middle school, we changed the entrance. That was all part of that grant program to promote walking. So, um, you know, Mr. Sloop is correct. Uh, it's a great way to do it, and uh, it will help us on buses where we got to continue to try to get uh, social distancing on buses for kids that live away, for, uh, away from that. So, Robin, what else? Nothing. All right. We're all caught up. Great. Mark so, let me uh, Go ahead. Was there a question that come on? No. Okay. Um, so just to kind of capture back where we are, and then I'm going to throw it to Mrs. Scott to, to summarize as well. As far as the reentry plan, in two weeks, we're going to unveil it to the school board. But I will tell you that as, as some of the things start to come out, we'll be sharing that information out. For example, uh, later today, you're going to get a, a – a memo, all parents in the community are going to get a memo from all the area superintendents talking about the things that we're all going to agree to. And I've already mentioned those on this call. Um, but it, it'll be like if you've got a fever, stay home for 72 hours. We're not going to use um, the water fountains. We're going to say, please strongly recommend face masks to and from school. Um, one thing I do want to tell you is we are. Um, going to limit the number of visitors in the buildings all year long so we're not going to allow parents to come in uh, for lunch unfortunately um, we're also going to limit uh, build trips and those type things in this era we would love to be able to get back to those and i will tell you we're also looking at uh, student teachers um, and, and, and different volunteers we did talk to the Education Foundation and Study Buddy Program and First Scholars. 
will not be running this year as we know them. They won't be in in-person setting. First Scholars may be virtual, but study buddies will not. Um, so we are going to limit visitors um, just so that we can do school and everything. We are going to have more of a concierge service as far as when, when you need your child during the school day to come and, and run in, to leave, to go to doctor's appointment or whatever, we're going to have parents call in and then someone's going to walk the child out to you so you don't have to come into the building. Uh, so there's some things early on that we're looking at in terms of that reentry plan. We're going to unveil all of that on the 29th. You're invited. It's a Zoom meeting. Um, we had, I think, 30 people on last last board meeting, Zoom meeting. It was awesome. Everybody had great questions um, about the reentry plan. And if things come up today that you think about, you know, send me an email. If you want to be a part of the extended conversation, we would love to, to do that. Um, and, and we want people to partner with us on that. So that's the reentry plan. And ultimately, moms and dads, community, it's your decision how we best deliver education to your child. We want to partner with you. We want to make sure it happens so that your child continues to grow and that we all stay healthy. Um, our, our goal um, is to individual student growth for the kids, but it's also to mitigate the virus in the buildings. We do not want to make sure that we're getting that virus to come in and, and replicate itself and spread. So those are the things that we're doing inside of our reentry plan. Um, so that, that's it. Uh, Mrs. Scott, special ed specific. Yeah, I mean, as, as we look at um, services for students, you know, our occupational therapists and physical therapists do need to work in close proximity most of the time with our students. And um, sometimes we can be at a, at a safe, socially distance and a safer distance delivering that instruction, but, you know, they'll wear masks. Um, they're going to wear gloves, especially when they're touching students. We know we have to do a lot of hand over hand with occupational therapy. Um, there's motion things we do or just touching students with physical therapy. So we'll make sure that that, that is happening. Our speech pathologists um, will have clear masks so that students can read their facial expressions, but also see their face when, when also providing um, the speech and language therapy. Um, we're gonna try to reduce transitions the best we can. And again, the, everything that we do will be on a, on a student by student basis. Um, we'll follow their IEPs, review and revise IEPs as needed. Um, I don't necessarily think we have to come in and do all you know, 925 of them, but um, individually we will look at students and make that determination. And, and that's where I rely on parents too, to communicate with us. Um, please do not wait necessarily for us to reach out to you. If you have a question or concern, do it immediately so that we can get that answer for you. Um, and hopefully, hopefully also ease any, you know, um, stress that you're feeling about school. Um, we may not have all of the answers right now, but between now and the start of school, we will. Um, so you can always reach out to me. I think Robin may have put a link in and I didn't see what it was, but um, you can email me and I'll have Robin if you want to put my email in there um, so that I can answer those questions because I know you sit at home and you're not part of our conversations on a daily basis. So um, I want to make sure that you have answers, but we're going to go back, do the best that we can, um, or, you know, follow the law, um, revise when we need to and, and move on from there. Um, I did also want to talk a little bit about um, mental health. One more thing. Um, part of the referendum was to, to get people and resources in. We do have our two therapy dogs with us now. They have been trained. So at Webb Elementary School and at Northwood, the two dogs will reside on, da on a daily basis. Um, they're going to help us with some of that anxiety and fear stuff. And we're being trained in that. But um, that's something new. And then Kim Sperling is also our director of mental health. So if you have a specific question about uh, something or a, th a strategy you think works or could, could help us, please reach out. We're going to include her email uh, in this string as well. So you can touch base with her and, and uh, move forward. But we know that the mental health side of this thing is just as important as the physical health um, uh, as we do school. Um, so that's where we're at. A couple other announcements. Please um, go into PowerSchool and register if you've not done that yet as a parent so that we can have all the updated information. If you know of a kindergarten parent that's planning to come to our school this coming year, all that is online. And um, you can find that on our homepage and the front page and go ahead and get registered for kindergarten. 
Um, we're going to look to do some things differently, obviously, with like back to school events and that. And the principals are working on that. We want to make sure we know how many people are coming. In our most recent survey in the feedback loop, and we got three different ones throughout this COVID-19 era, 80% of the parents said, oh, we're coming back to school. 20% of the parents said, I want to see what's happening, but we're leaning towards coming to school. And then we had one uh, about 1%, a little less than 1%. Uh, say, I don't think I'm coming back to school because they they of the health precautions. And I realize that's 101 percent, but yet 20 was just like 19 percent and 1 percent what it was on the on the unsure and not coming back. We are probably going to send out one more survey in early July, asking for parents if you're coming back, are you planning to come back in person, or are you going to come to to partner with us to another like online fashion or something like that so we can gather that up information so look for that survey um, and we will have another coffee with the superintendent coming up um, I think what we're gonna do though we're, we may um, we're gonna shift the time and day probably to allow some of the parents that are working or back at work now to to join in the conversation so uh, Rob and Mrs. Betts are our Communication specialists will figure out that date and time coming up, uh, but we will be having at least one more in June, and then I think we'll probably have a couple in July, um, as well as uh, video casts and, and those type of things to reach out to moms and dads community about what we're doing. So that's where we're headed. Um, so, Mrs. Betts, anything else? No other questions have come up. Um, like I said, this video will share back out via Blackboard email, so you'll have the recording. Um, but we appreciate you coming because if no one attends, the recording doesn't have anything on it. So yeah. thanks for coming. Well, the, the superintendent's uh, coffees, I will tell you, in this COVID-19 era have been well attended. Um, usually when I do them during the school year, we get four or five or six people. Uh, last time, I think we had 43 when we talked about the, the plan, we also talked about uh, diversity and inclusion. And I'd love to spend more time talking about that one. That maybe is going to be our next topic because we are, as a school, uh, committed to, to making a difference. And we have a subcommittee working on that. If you want to hear more about that, just reach out to me. Um, and I did talk about the school board meeting, but we had about 43 last time. Today I saw, I think we got into the 30s, if I, if I saw by little ticker going up as I was talking. Uh, but I, I appreciate all your parents. And I know that it's, it's, it's been a, an interesting journey for all of us. Um, and I just want to thank you for trusting us that we're doing the right things uh, and also asking questions and holding us accountable to make sure that we're doing the right things. Because that's how, that's how we get to be a great school district. And, and I know I'm very biased, but I do believe we have a great school district. I think we're leading in many things in this COVID-19 era, uh, and it, it's the work of many people um, that are doing that. So I just want to say thank you. So with that, we're about three minutes over our time. I do apologize for going a few minutes over, um, and and we'll go forward So uh, and, and just close out. So thanks, everyone. We'll talk to you real soon. Thank you, Mrs. Scott, for co-hosting today.